أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على سيدنا محمد وآله الطاهرين We're on chapter 3 of the social system of Islam uh, which is part 3 as well and uh, this particular topic is discussing the Islamic form, the Islamic system of building a municipality. How should a city be run uh, from the Islamic perspective? It's a very important issue because it discusses a variety of things um, from the Islamic approach to how to have a Muslim or Islamic image as far as a city is concerned. And Although we've discussed a lot of social elements to how we need to interact with other citizens in a city, we haven't discussed what the basis of this city should look like from an Islamic perspective. And Islam does have a lot to say when it comes to uh, building, when it comes to uh, the d dividing of, for example, responsibilities and things like that. Um, what the public uh, space should be, what the private dominion uh, should be. A lot of these are the very, very interesting things to do with um, cultural centers, religious centers, educational facilities, uh, hygiene, uh, public cleanliness, uh, how a house should be uh, divided and things like that. So it's, it is indeed an interesting topic to um, look into and there's a lot that um, all of us can uh, benefit from. Now, uh, should your house be, um, for example, Islamic in the sense of it needs to look like how it used to look like at that time? No, we need to always bear in mind the issue of zaman and makan, space um, and or place and time. And uh, important thing is that there is an emphasis on uh, the Islamic household being elegant, being clean, uh, not being luxurious or extravagant. And there's a difference between luxurious and extravagant and elegant and clean. And that's why the hadith, even from Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alihi, he says, Ubnu madainakum mushrifah. Well, you should build your cities mushrifah. Not mushrifah as in... Um, uh, that Ashrafi kind of no, uh, noble class, the bourgeoisie class. No, Mushrifa in the sense that it has value, that it has meaning. Which is why when it does come to something like uh, building an Islamic house, you need to remember the Shari side of things. Like, you know that it is haram for you to be facing the Qibla or you're back to the Qibla when uh, you are relieving yourself in the toilet. So you remember that the toilet seat should be uh, built in such a way where it is um, not facing the Qibla or nor is it back, it's back to the Qibla. Another example, you know, you want to make sure that the uh, women in the household are, are comfortable. They don't need to be wearing hijab all the time, you know. So you build the house in such a way where if you do have a guest, the guest is not going to invade the privacy of the women. They don't need to be, um, you know, isolated in, in that particular sense. They have their freedom. They can do as, as they wish. And, you know, Islamic households in the traditional Islamic architectural sense did cater to all of these things. Now, one of the things that uh, is important when it does come to uh, the public services, because I did say that um, when you're building a city, you need to look at the public side of things. The public services is based from an Islamic perspective, is based on uh, gaining funds from uh, the public Muslim treasury. So it is the duty of the Muslim treasury of Baytul Mal to cover the costs of whatever is needed uh, for the uh, public sphere. Now, where does the money from the Muslim funds come from? From the people themselves, from zakat, from khums, from sadaqat, from all of these other financial donations given by the Muslims themselves. And also you can extend that to uh, mm, 
maybe investing in property or whatever it is that you know uh, is possible for a an Islamic municipality to uh, do. Um, in addition to this, even when there are in the, in the case of non-Muslims, a non-Muslim uh, is not obliged to in a Muslim society in an Islamic country, a non-Muslim is not obliged to pay khums or zakat in that ideal sense because you know they, they, there's no taklif directed at them but instead of that they pay the jizya and the jizya is the equivalent of the wajib payments made by Muslims contrary to unfortunately how it is portrayed uh, by Islamophobes I, I must call them Islamophobes who try to you know um, find the most weirdest of explanations for things and and um, in a very perverted understanding uh, misrepresent the reality of what it is and uh, explain it in a harsh way that of course when the reader does read it they would condemn Islam and condemn Muslims but jizya is nothing more than what is wajib for a Muslim to pay so you expect Muslims to pay in an Islamic, a purely Islamic society you ex uh, or government, you expect Muslims to pay everything and non-Muslims, uh, for example, living under the sovereignty of um, Muslim land or Islamic uh, government pays absolutely nothing. No, it doesn't make sense. So it's rather the opposite. They've, it's always been the case where non-Muslims were very, very comfortable for hundreds of years if there were cases of um, payment of jizya and things like that, they would do it wholeheartedly. Now, uh, we need to remember that when it does come to the issue of Baytul Mal um, or the Muslim treasury, this is a very, very sensitive topic as well, you know, because Baytul Mal is no joke. It's the, it's the public funds. It's um, something that a person will be very much held accountable for on Judgment Day. And that's why there are so many ahadith that uh, speak about how Ahlul Bayt السلام, dealt with Baytul Mal and the sensitivity of uh, Baytul Mal. Uh, and you know, there are many, many stories from uh, the likes of, uh, for example, Imam Ali, alayhi, and when he was the Khalifa, and how he dealt with uh, Baytul Mal. We know that Baytul Mal is spent on the public funds, on the uh, making sure that people are um, comfortable living uh, in, in that particular sense and at the same time remembering that if a person does uh, increase in the spending or steal maybe even from uh, public funds, then of course they will have a very, very um, severe punishment on Judgment Day. That's based on the Ahadith. Now, one example of what we can see as uh, public funds uh, we mentioned is building of schools, building of hospitals, building of uh, public facilities, uh, remembering that you know you're going to need to make sure that all of these things are um, facilitated for the people building of wells as well you know it's also something emphasized very much on a hadith and of course uh, one of the applications of public service is sadaqa charity giving donation alms giving and as Muslims, alhamdulillah, we all know uh, how much Islam emphasizes on sadaqah and on charity giving. And um, there's a, a special emphasis here given by Islam on charity giving because it needs to manage the affairs of the underprivileged, of the poor, of those who are not fortunate enough to be able, for example, to work or to have um, uh, sustainability in their work 
or to have any kind of sustenance that, I, that, they, that they are regularly uh, able to live off of. And therefore, financial help is something very, very important. Of course, the spiritual help is always going, the moral help is always going to be there as well, you know, but at the end of the day, they need these poor people, these destitutes, they need food on the table, they need um, medication, they need shelter, there are a variety, they need clothes, they need a variety of things, you know, and sadaqah deals with that, which is exactly why the most recommended mustahab thing for a person to do on a regular basis is pay sadaqah. If you do this, pay sadaqah. If you do that, pay sadaqah. If you go there, pay sadaqah. A sadaqah to tadfa'ul bala. Sadaqah repels um, any kind of evil misfortune that might come a person's way. And that's why sadaqah is very, very uh, valuable from the Islamic perspective of uh, social interaction with those who are uh, underprivileged. And this is why um, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alihi, he says, Khayru ma lil mar, the best money of a person, the best form of financial gains of a person, the khairuhu as sadaqa is what he or she saves up as charity giving, as sadaqah, as charity giving. Another hadith says about when we should give sadaqah. Obviously, you should be giving sadaqah whenever in, in any time that you are able to. And sadaqah, when you're giving charity, it doesn't necessarily need to be big sums of money. It can be coins uh, if you want to. It's the near, it's the intention that is very important. You know, when you are paying sadaqah and you know that paying sadaqah is going to repel evil, repel misfortune, repel all these other things, you also know that you're going to be helping someone. So it's a win-win basis. Yes, it's very hard to get money. It's very hard to earn money. But at the same time, how are you showing your, your gratitude to God? How are you expressing your solidarity with those un unfortunate people who are around you. You know, how are you able to go against your nafs and combat your nafs by um, suppressing your dunyawi uh, desires because of your love for money? The best way is to give it away. Do you need to give all of it away? No, the Quran says, don't close your hand into a fist and lock it to your neck, nor should you open it out all the way. And that is in reference to don't be a stingy, greedy person. Uh, also, don't be someone who isn't able to manage your finances in a correct way and think that, well, I'm just, just going to give it all away. No, be moderate, have that balance. You know, you earn an income of this much money, 5% of it, 2% of it, whatever it may be, give it to mustahab sadaqah, mustahab charity. Perfect. You don't, it doesn't need to be 50%. You could probably be giving 1%, but with pure intention, and it will be accepted in the hands, in the eyes of God. And also reach someone who's going to help live off of it. That's the, that's the beautiful thing about sadaqah. So you should be giving sadaqah um, whenever you're able to. But here, just some a few cases uh, in where Ahlul Bayt have mentioned um, when sadaqah is uh, best to be given. One hadith from Imam, ha um, Imam Ali where he says to um, his son Imam Hassan, make sure that when you, whenever you have food, you pay sadaqah, or from that food, you give out as charity. Another hadith from Imam Sadiq alayhi salam, he says, Bakiru bil sadaqa, which means uh, the Bakiru bil sadaqa means which means pay sadaqa in the mornings. You're leaving the house, you're just about to cross the road, you're just about to get in your car, you have this little sadaqa box of yours. You put in a few coins and you start off your day uh, positively 
also having given char charity. That's, you know, you feel very uplifted when you do give sadaqah. You feel that you've done something. And that's, that's the humanity of it. That's the humane side of uh, who you are. Another hadith, um, and so the morning is very important. And one hadith says that if you do pay sadaqah in the morning, your bad omen will be removed for the rest of the day. Another hadith from Imam Sadiq salam says that uh, Jum'ah is a day of sadaqah, that you should pay your sadaqah also on a Jum'ah. We know that um, anything that we do as far as acts of worship is concerned is multiplied in its reward on a Friday. And so uh, charity also is very good to be given on that time. Another hadith from Imam Sadiq where he says that when you start your a trip, when you start a trip, you should be paying, uh, you should pay sadaqah. Um, iftatih safaraka bis sadaqati. This hadith is from Imam Sadiq. Start off your trip with sadaqah. وَقْرَأْ آيَةُ الْكُرْسِ إِذَا بَدَى لَكْ And also you should recite آيَةُ الْكُرْسِ You should also recite آيَةُ الْكُرْسِ whenever you remember it. Then there's uh, another case where Imam Rida sallallahu alayhi he says that you should uh, pay sadaqa at the time of iftar. At the time of iftar. من تصدق وقت إفطاره على مسكينين برغيف غفر الله له ذنبه وكتب له ثواب عتق رقبة من ولدي إسماعيل beautiful hadith um, so at the time of iftar also another application for when is the best time to pay sadaqa in Rajab the best time to pay sadaqa in Sha'ban the best time to say to pay sadaqa in Ramadan al-Mubarak in Shahr Ramadan al-Mubarak the best time to pay uh, sadaqa now um, let me read the hadith مَنْ تَصَدَّقَ فِي هَذَا الشَّهْرِ يعني in شَهْرِ رَمَضَانِ The Holy Prophet says, whoever pays sadaqa in the شهر, holy month of Ramadan, مَنْ تَصَدَّقَ فِي هَذَا الشَّهْرِ بِصَدَقَ غَفَرَ اللَّهُ لَهُ Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will forgive them. Now what are the applications of sadaqa? Is it only giving out money and coins? The answer is no. You can do sadaqa in a variety of ways. One is by doing something good. By doing something good. The Holy Prophet says, Kullu ma'rufin sadaqa. Anything that is good is sadaqa. Uh, even in, in, in the Holy Quran, it says, Al-kalimatu tayyibah, that a nice statement that you're saying to someone is a kind of uh, sadaqa. Um, number two, so doing some, doing, being kind and doing something nice to someone is a form of sadaqah. Number two, afdalu sadaqa, the Holy Prophet says, the best form of sadaqa is saqiyul ma, is uh, irrigating water, which means you build a well, you build pipes, you allow people to have access to water. That is uh, the best form of uh, sadaqa. Another example is explaining something to a, a deaf person. Someone who cannot hear, you explain something to them. Isma'u al-asammi min ghayri tadajurin sadaqatun Hani'ah, this hadith is from Imam Sadiq salam. Another example, another application, Nashrul Ilm, spreading knowledge is a form of sadaqa. Another example, it'am, we've mentioned feeding someone is a form of sadaqa. Another example, tolerating people, you know, being there for people is a form of sadaqa. Then, of course, we, we need to remember uh, that 
You know, you want to uh, make sure that your sadaqa gets to the right place. You want to make sure that it is without any kind of miniya or uh, favoring. You know, when you're giving some, something to someone, you want to make sure that you preserve their dignity, their respect. There's the, that very famous story from Imam Hussein alayhi salam. When he gave charity to a beggar who came knocking on their door, he gave it behind the door. So he didn't allow himself to see the beggar. So he gave it like that. And then he was asked, why did you do that? He said, because I didn't want to see the person face to face. So the next time this person does see me, he doesn't feel humiliated, you know, that I gave him some sadaqah. So, uh, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi reminds us that we need to make sure that we have pure intention. لا خير, he says to Imam Ali, Ya Ali, لا خير في القول إلا مع الفعل. There's no benefit, there's no goodness in saying something unless you have your actions to back it up and support it. وَلَا صَدَقَ إِلَّا مَعَ الْنِيَّةِ And there's no sadaqa, there's no true charity given, giving unless you have the pure intention for it. Another important uh, thing to keep in mind as far as the etiquette of sadaqa is concerned is to remember that when we are giving out charity, we're giving it from our halal money. And we're doing it ourselves. We're not delegating someone else to do it. We're doing it ourselves. It's me that's doing it. I am initiating in it. Um, uh, Imam Sadiq salam was asked, Ayyu sadaqati afdal? What sadaqa is the best form of sadaqa? What sadaqa is the best? Then he says, Anta tasaddaq wa anta sahihun, shahihun, ta'malu al-baqa wa takhafu al-faqr that you that sadaqa that is given is when you are in your in your good states when you are comfortable when you are happy uh you giving sadaqa not when you have problems then you start thinking of sadaqa no when you are normal you know be thankful be grateful show that gratefulness to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala by paying sadaqa sometimes you should be paying sadaqa sirran which means privacy, privately, sometimes you should be paying sadaqah ala niyatan, which means publicly. And it is said that when you are paying sadaqah, it doesn't reach in that person's hand, it, reach straight, it reaches straight into the hand of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And that's from a hadith where uh, we understand that uh, the, also another hadith says that a sadaqah extinguishes, turns off, the wrath of hellfire of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala as well. And, and so sometimes you need to be giving sadaqa publicly so to encourage others, but you keep your niyyah in being pure and sincerely for the sake of God. Sometimes you're also going to be giving uh, sadaqa privately also for the sake of you wanting to uh, test yourself, test your niyyah that you know, all the absolutely nobody knows about it. Are you still going to do it? Or is, is it only you wanting to be there and do it for the sake of fame and other people praising you about it? Important thing is that when you are giving sadaqah, you are doing so um, in uh, the best form and you're content about it. You know, you're not doing it... Um, uh, with uh, wanting to hurt someone uh, as, the had, as the verse in the Holy Quran says لا تبطلوا صدقاتكم بالمن والأذى Don't invalidate your sadaqah by um, reminding them of your favor or by hurting them you know you don't scream at them and say okay here I'll give you a dollar or you don't humiliate them or degrade them or ask them to do for example, some weird things or something like that. Another thing that's also important is if it is not your money, then you need to have consent of who it is that you are taking the money from. And this is in the case of a wife and a husband. If the wife is living off the husband's money, it's not her personal money, then she should have his consent when it comes to 
um, the uh, payment of sadaqa. That's an important point that also uh, Ayatollah Jawadi Amuli mentions uh, here. Inna imra'atan sa'alathu faqalat, Ya Rasulullah, a woman asked the Holy Prophet and said, Ya Rasulullah, ma haqqu zawj ala zawjati, what is the right of a husband over his wife? Then the Holy Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi, in a long hadith, a part of it says, an la tatasaddaq min baytihi illa bi'idhni, that she doesn't pay sadaqah from his funds, min baytihi, and his funds, illa bi'idhni, unless with his consent. And then Ayatollah Jawadi says that, well, if it's her money, then she doesn't need his consent if she is paying sadaqah. والحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على سيدنا محمد وآله الطاهرين